Adam, I have something I need to confess. Oh, boy. Another one of these. So I'm not actually a dinosaur paleontologist. Oh, shocking. We've shocking. talked about this. I study mammals, but we talk a lot about dinosaurs on this show. That's true. You know, it's funny. Thinking back to the first episode where we talked about why we became paleontologists, a lot of that had to do with the childhood obsession with dinosaurs. And dinosaurs yeah, are... And- Amazing, And I wanted to study dinosaurs when I first became a paleontologist. But then, well, to be honest, I'm not a dinosaur paleontologist either. I I study reptiles. I at least study things from the age of reptiles. But they're not technically dinosaurs. They don't have those upright limbs. They don't have all those dinosaur features. So I'm... Basically a disappointment, as are you, to anyone who finds out we're paleontologists. Oh, I always think that. <laughs> <laughs> they find out we're paleontologists and then that we don't actually work on dinosaurs. So here's, here's my proposition. Here's my proposition. Right, I think that we should get another voice in on, on pastime and one that, that is a dinosaur investigator. Oh, my gosh. A, a dinosaur, a real dinosaur paleontologist? Yeah, there's got to be one who'll be friends with us. I guess. I don't know. They're all so cool. Hey, guys. What are you doing? Hi, Catherine. How are you? Hey! I'm good. (laughs) How are you? What are you doing in Yale? Oh, well, I'm just visiting the collections of the Yale Peabody Museum. Collections of what? Well, I'm looking at fossils of avian dinosaurs. I'm Adam Pritchard. I'm Matt Bortz. And you're listening to Pastime. Hey, you're Matt. a dinosaur enthusiast. You're yeah. a dinosaur enthusiast and dinosaur investigator. Indeed I am, and I'm specifically enthusiastic about avian dinosaurs. And as we should know from listening to this podcast, that really means birds in the, the common tongue, as we'll say. <laughs> Check episode two for details. Yeah, so for my current investigations, I look at the evolution of the brains of birds And to look at that, I need to look at their fossils. Because if you're looking at evolution of anything, you need to look into deep time, into the fossil record, to really understand it. But the trick is that brains, in birds at least, don't fossilize. And so how do you study something that doesn't preserve in the fossil record? That was exactly the question I was going to ask. <laughs> this seems like a difficult proposition. Yeah, because brains are kind of gooey. I mean, yeah. it's, it's like studying guts in the fossil record right. or, or muscles. Like I said bones and teeth, they're great. Oh, they're yeah, no, study. no. We're lazy relative to, you know, to people who study the soft tissue structures. Well, the good thing is that some soft tissues, like muscles or brains, actually leave markers on the bones. So... We can use studying the bones to also study the brain. So, for example, in birds, the shape of the bones of the brain case, so the bones that surround the brain in life in the skull, actually pretty faithfully reflect the shape of the outside surface of the brain. And so we can look at the shape of the brain in the fossil record. We can't get at internal anatomy just from looking at the bones, But we can get an understanding of what the brain looked like in the fossil record and compare that to what the outside of the brain looks like in their modern day relatives. So you're basically making a, you know, using the negative space inside of the skull to create a a cast of what the brain looked like. So how do you actually collect that cast? (laughs) Well, so the cast that Adam is talking about is an endocast, endocast, and the way we collect that endocast currently is by doing CT scanning. Now, before CT scanning was a big thing, people would make maybe physical endocasts, so if they could cut open the fossil or found one that was cut open already, they would maybe fill it with rubber and then pull it out, they could see it. You know, whenever I cut open a skull in a museum collection, the curators always get mad at me for some reason. I don't, I don't really understand that. So it's a good thing that we have a, a way to, to do it without actually damaging the specimen. It seems like a a really good thing. It's certainly opened up a lot more possibilities to study specimens. Curators tend to like it a lot more if you want to study their one specimen known in the world of a certain animal in a non-destructive way. (laughs) And so 
we use CT scanning, which is like a 3D x-ray, basically. It goes around and takes x-ray images from lots of different planes, and then the computer puts them all together into a stack of images that you can scroll through and get an idea of the 3D shape of the specimen. And you can also use that to reconstruct the spaces within the skull, for example. It really is the same technology. It was used to like look inside of my, my abdomen when I had appendicitis. Like it's, it's the same thing, but applied to a completely different system. Exactly. Your appendix, rest in peace. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't need it. So how do you actually take those scans and slice them up? Is that something that you're doing on a special computer program? Yeah, so I use a special computer program called Aviso. I think it was originally developed for engineers who want to look at the internal material properties of different things like, you know, concrete, for example. And so, yeah, we go through, we do something called segmentation, which is really just selecting the area of interest in uh, the slices that you can see it in. And then, again, the computer puts it all together in one nice virtual model of whatever you're interested in looking at. So once you have this virtual model, then what are you hoping to to learn about the brains of of birds and their relatives? What I'm doing for my research is comparing the surface areas of certain structures that show up on these models and have discrete boundaries that you can see, um, and comparing those surface areas to the published volumes of the brain structures that lie immediately underneath those. And so a lot of people have done something called histological sectioning of the brains of birds where they take, they dissect out the brain and then they stabilize it so it doesn't just smush when you slice it. And then they slice it up really thinly and stain those slices so that you can see the different cells in the different brain regions. And so by doing that, they've been able to publish the volumes of brain structures And I mathematically compare those volumes to the surface areas of the endocast structures that lie on top of them to see if there is a strong relationship that we can use to predict the brain structure size in extinct birds where you can't get that that volume. What kind of structures are we talking about that are visible on the surface of the brain and what could those tell us? So both of the structures that I'm looking at, and they're probably the two structures that show up the most consistently on the endocasts of birds, Um, One is called the volst, the volst, that's the name of the endocast structure, and it is overlying a brain structure called the hyperpileum, which does higher order processing of visual information as well as a few other types of information. And the other structure on the endocast that I look at is called the optic lobe, the optic lobe, and that overlies something called the optic tectum in the brains of birds, and that is another visual structure that is receiving information directly from the eyeball and sending it back up to other parts of the brain. So both of these are involved in vision. And in modern day birds, researchers have found that the size of this can be correlated with different aspects of uh, potential visual capabilities in birds. So you're working on a lot of really you're working on, on brain anatomy. You're working uh, in the, the family tree of dinosaurs. You're using uh, scanning technology for computer programs. How did you acquire all these skills, all the abilities you need to, to investigate your question? How did, you, how did you get here? Well, funnily enough, unlike you two, I didn't want to be a paleontologist growing up. I didn't <gasps> even really know it was an option. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. This interview is over. I'm sorry. I'm kicked out. (laughs) And so growing up, I was just really into animals of all sorts. And so I thought the way you get to work with animals is by being a veterinarian. And I think that's a pretty common concept among kids. You know, that's that's one of the most common careers in like, this is a job you could have books. If there's an animal, it's usually a veterinarian. And so that's what I always thought I wanted to be. And, And then senior year of high school, I did a little bit of shadowing. And then freshman year in college, I took pre-vet specific classes. And I was starting to say, mm, yeah, maybe, maybe this isn't exactly what I wanted to do. What, what made you change your mind? So what made me change my mind is that I found when I like, did the shadowing, I found that I was really into the rounds portion of it where they would say, like, this is, this is the problem that the patient is presenting with. What are the potential causes of this? So thinking through the problems, but 
I guess I didn't realize how much hard work veterinarians have to put into just the interactions with their owners of their patients and the difficulty of like learning the anatomy of all of these different types and then of animals and then holding their lives in your hand as you're doing surgery because at the heart of it veterinarians are also doctors and so I guess I didn't really make that connection in my mind when Mm. I was a kid growing up that you know that's a huge responsibility to have and that also wasn't necessarily how my brain was working it wasn't working like okay you know I've got I've got to fix this problem that is immediately in front of me and will affect something's life (laughs) well it sounds like you were interested in basically the part of being a veterinarian that involves asking scientific questions exactly but I didn't really know what to do with that interest you know after I decided "Eh, probably vet school's probably not for me Didn't really know what to do, so took a few more classes, and then sophomore year, I got into um, an introduction to dinosaurs class that I just took on a whim. It sounded like fun, and it was. It was so much fun. Um, It was taught by doctors Mary Schweitzer and Dan Sepka, and it was a pretty big, like, 100-level kind of intro class, so there were a lot of people in that class, but I was just so absorbed in the material that I uh, approached them afterwards and asked if they were teaching any other classes on that topic. And Dan Sefka said, yeah, we, we have another one coming up next semester. You should take it. So I did. And then there was another one coming up the next semester. So I took that too. <laughs> and at one point, uh, Dan asked me if I would like to have a position in his lab working on some of his research projects and maybe developing some of my own. And so I said, well, sure, that, that sounds good. You know, I'm, I'm looking for jobs and it was a paying position and I'm really interested in this stuff. So I might as well pursue it. And Dan Sepka is actually a legendary paleontologist who studies bird evolution, specifically the evolution of things like penguins. Exactly. So little did I know I was setting myself down a path to become a paleontologist. <laughs> Because even towards close to graduation, I wasn't really sure if this was a feasible career for me. And I think that is an important consideration for anyone who is going into paleontology, that it, like many other scientific fields, is highly competitive, um, and there aren't necessarily a lot of jobs in it. And so I was still trying to to keep my mind open. Uh, Mary Schweitzer still likes to tease me about how I kept saying I wasn't going to be a paleontologist. (laughs) because I was trying to be so practical. Um, But I did research with Dan. I presented a few projects with him at the annual meeting of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. And then I took a year off after undergrad and took that time to apply to graduate programs in paleontology. (laughs) Still telling Mary Schweitzer that you weren't really going to be a paleontologist, probably. I think at that point I had accepted that I was going down that road. (laughs) And it's been great because now I do get to think about these questions um, about, you know, animals and how how they work, how they came to be, how they are. So the evolutionary processes that led to the groups we see today. Um, And so it's, it's a very fulfilling career, but not one that I ever saw for myself when I was younger, just because I don't think that was ever presented as an option. I didn't know any paleontologists. There aren't really that many of us. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and so, and and having that kind of open mindedness, even even changing your career while you're while you're at university, or th- considering other career options at university, I think it's something that that's that that shows that you were continuing to be curious about what you could do. Like that's itself a kind of scientific way of looking at the world. <laughs> yeah, and there are people who have made that decision and stayed curious well into, for example, like middle age and then become paleontologists too. You know, it's not, it's not something that you have to decide early on or even in college or even in grad school. There are people who have gotten degrees in other fields and then gone to grad school for paleontology too. So I think having that, that flexibility and that openness of mind is very important in general if you are looking to become a scientist or maybe an engineer, you know, things that that require a lot of training. Sometimes that training doesn't have to happen right away, and sometimes you are better prepared for the training if you've taken time to get there naturally. I ended up at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. I work with Dr. Larry Whitmer 
and his lab is really interested in uh, reconstructing the soft tissues of extinct animals, usually focusing in on archosaurs and dinosaurs specifically. Um, so it ended up being a really good fit for the research I was doing because actually in Dan Sepka's lab, I started doing some of this. Um, that's where I got my first CT scan processing tr training. Um, and I started on a project on bird brain endocasts in his lab. And that was the project that I really got into. And I felt like there were a lot of questions still to be answered. And so when I was doing my grad school interviews, that was kind of the project I was putting forth for potential advisors. Um, so Larry's lab ended up being a really good fit for a project like that, looking at the shape or the morphology of soft tissues that you can reconstruct from the markers on the bone. And so I'm there, but I'm currently, as we said, at in New Haven, Connecticut, at the Yale Peabody Museum. I came here to study their collections of uh, fossil birds and specifically looking at things with skulls because it's kind of hard to reconstruct things from skulls if they don't have them anymore. Now, you don't have any fossil birds of your own at, the, uh, at Ohio University? No, we don't. So Ohio University does have a vertebrate collection, uh, which just means a scientific collection of lots of animals with backbones, um, but they're all modern day species. And mm. so it's good to, to build a collection like that. Uh, first of all, it's kind of easy. You need a collection permit to pick up remains of wild animals, and then you just find them on the side of the road. <laughs> um, and so that's been built by quite a few faculty at Ohio University. It also gets used a lot in teaching, like uh, comparative vertebrate anatomy. They bring out those a lot. So we have a lot of modern day birds, which actually form a big part of my dissertation research, but no fossils because we're not a registered museum and mm, fossils okay. need to be deposited in uh, museums so that they can be accessible to lots of different researchers. Now, what do we have here at Yale that particularly caught your attention? Like what, what do our bird fossils look like? Well, they have quite a few MOA, which is actually one of the first things I worked on in Larry's lab. Uh, we CT scanned a MOA skull from the Field Museum, and I reconstructed its endocast. And there's quite a few MOA in the collections here at the Peabody Museum um, for me to look at. Uh, and also... refresh, refresh me on what, what the, who the MOA was. Oh, so the MOA is a relative of things like ostriches and emu um, that was even bigger than those. It was giant, I want to say probably like eight feet tall, some of the species. There were um, a few different species. Some of them were more like turkey size. So there's a range. But the biggest ones stood taller than humans, I would say. I don't think we have any eight feet tall humans on a record yet. <laughs> um, and they basically didn't even have wings at this point. They were flightless, really long neck, long legs, kind of bulky body. Um, and they evolved on New Zealand in the absence of mammals, so they didn't have any mammalian predators. Their only predator before humans arrived in the form of the Maori um, were this a giant eagle called the Haas eagle. And so they could kind of get away with not being able to run away from things really well because there weren't, you know, big mammalian predators chasing them down. Hmm. So um, flightless birds living on islands. Sounds like dodos, basically. Yeah, yeah. So and On a much larger scale. Yes. And also, like, kiwi, which are another relative of MOA, and they're still alive today, although they're also not doing so well, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, they, they were doing fine, and then humans arrived, and within a couple hundred years, MOA were wiped out. <laughs> and, but they that probably tasted mean, really good. <laughs> yeah, they were probably easy, easy picking, so... That's how it goes, I guess. But that does mean that we have some really nicely preserved uh, skeletons of MOA, actually quite a few because they were so recent. Um, and so the Peabody has a few of those. They also have some uh, some amazing fossils of these skulls of things like Hesperornis and Ichthyornis. Um, these are much older birds than MOA. Much we're older birds. Like, what, 75, 80 million years yeah. old? Yeah. And they also still had teeth in their beaks, in some, some regions of their beaks. So uh, much older, also much more squished than many MOA fossils. But it's still, um, while we might not have the brain case preserved in three dimensions, you still have uh, the canals that you can see for the cranial nerves, for example, emerging from the brain case. Um, and they also give me a chance to look at another part of my dissertation, which is looking at 
the holes in the tips of their beaks that housed blood vessels and nerves. And so in some modern day species, uh, people have shown that that if they have something called a bill tip organ, which is a high concentration of mechanoreceptors housed in these pits at the tips of their beaks. So these would be organs that can detect, like, touch on a very sensitive yes, level, right? Yeah, touch okay. or vibration. Um, and if they have a high concentration of those, they actually seem to have these um, sensory feeding special specializations so that they can, for example, for like sandpipers or kiwi, they can feel buried prey in the ground. They stick the tip of their bill in the ground and they can feel their prey moving even if they're not in direct contact. So that's a high sensitivity there. And then they can locate them and pick them out. Because you figure if, you're, if your bill tip is buried in the ground, you're not going to be able to see what it's feeling. They're almost like daredevil birds. It's awesome. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Heightened senses. Um, and then other groups like uh, waterfowl, so ducks and geese, um, when they're feeding a lot of times, or at least the ones that are feeding in the water, they're dabbling around with their, you know, their bills that are kind of shaped like spatulas that are really flat. And they're feeling for food items and they're also filtering the water for those food items. So they have a lot of these touch receptors on their bills. Um, and parrots also have a lot of touch receptors within their bills because they're manipulating their food. So they have a really mobile bill relative to the position of their skull and um, tongue also that they use to move their food items. But of course, if it's within your really big bill, you can't see what you're doing. Um, so those are three groups that we know have these high concentrations of touch receptors at the tips of their bills. And so I'm interested in figuring out if the um, that presence of this feeding specialization that's mediated by that sense is uh, fairly represented by the number of holes for the mechanoreceptors in the bills, because that's something we can see on the skeletons. And so when I'm here looking at the back end of the skull for the brain, I also want to look at the front end now to see if um, there are holes for the, that sensory specialization, because since it is sensory and it's mediated by a cranial nerve, that ties back to the sensory system that's encased in the brain case. So you're studying the central nervous system from both ends of the head, basically. Yeah. That's, that's really neat. Yeah. And so some of the fossils that here at the Peabody Museum um, are really good for maybe not so much if the brain case is squished, but the front of the um, face is going to be better preserved because there's not a you know giant pocket of air where the brain used to be. And that's one of the amazing things about museum collections like the Yale Peabody Museums. The collection, the initial collection of some of those toothed bird fossils from the Cretaceous period happened in Kansas under the, the, under the auspices of Othniel Charles Marsh, one of like the founders of vertebrate paleontology in the whole of the North American continent. And that was, that was back in like the 1880s that that was happening initially still using those fossils collected over a century ago to advance our understanding of the evolution of dinosaurs. Yeah, absolutely. And with the uh, advent of all these new technologies like CT scanning, it also allows a completely new way of studying things. So there are researchers here at Yale who are studying um, Hesperornis and Ichthyornis non-avian dinosaur fossils that they have in the collections so they can take a similar approach and reconstruct the hard tissue anatomy, so the skeletons, as well as some of the soft tissue anatomy themselves. So that CT scanning really has opened up so many possibilities for studying these fossils that were collected centuries ago. It's a whole new look at very old <laughs> fossils. Well, because if, if Marsh had wanted to do anything yeah. like this, he would have had to, to crack open the fossil and like pick apart, like follow the holes, and like ultimately destroy a specimen that now, over 100 years later, we wouldn't be able to investigate. So part of what makes CT scanning so powerful as well is you can take this data, but you also leave the fossil because we don't know what kinds of techniques people are going to be using in the future. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I don't know about what techniques. Which any of our listeners yeah, I, could, <laughs> I thought you were going to reveal the future technology at this point, no, but apparently, I, apparently I you can't. Didn't. Okay. But it, it okay. speaks to the fact that even, like, like you said, that there are new questions and new technologies that can be applied to fossils. And we don't necessarily even know right now what that might be, what those questions are. And there are always more questions in paleontology. 
which is part of why it's so important to maintain these collections is because if if we just assumed we had used all the methods already and all the fossils had, had basically been used up, mm-hmm. why maintain it? Why keep them around if there's nothing more we can learn from them? And the answer to that is we don't know how much we can learn from them. Yeah, it there's is always more. Open, yeah, it's an open question. Like, we could... In a in hundred years, we could use some kind of molecular teleport. So, Catherine, as you continue with your new discoveries and continue to learn more and more about avian dinosaurs and their anatomy, would, would you mind sticking around and helping us uh, figure out the evolution of other dinosaurs and continue the conversation here on Pastime? Sure, I'd love to help with that. Not just dinosaurs. I mean, you know, we can... Talk to her about all kinds of new discoveries. I guess we can talk about you guys' research, too. Talk about the the fuzzy critters. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, oh, we have to talk about those. And so continue following uh, past time. We know we've been on hiatus for a very long time, um, but we're hoping to become a little more active in getting this out in the near future. Um, And pay attention to our Facebook feed, our Twitter feed, and uh, subscribe to us on iTunes. And don't forget to give us a review to help other people discover the wonderful world of paleontology. So with that, my name is Matt Bortz. I'm Adam Pritchard. I'm Catherine Early, and we'll see you next time on Pastime. <laughs>